not hallucinating, it's here at last, my categorical analysis and comparison of the plagiarized elements of The Witcher as originally swiped from the Elric fantasy series. I made very clear in my original vlog cum rant cum shitstorm entitled No More Witcher for Razor Fist and Why that the video in question was not to be mistaken as a full and categorical argument for the intellectual property theft perpetrated by Andrei Sapkowski in his creation of The Witcher. And with the recent news that a previously greenlit Elric Amazon TV show was actually cancelled due to, quote, too many similarities with The Witcher, it is half past fucking time to clear the air on this subject once and for fucking all. Before beginning, I first want to commend another video to your attention. This one produced by the YouTube channel the Neclo Libriatas, I apologize if I mispronounced that, entitled The Witcher and Plagiarism. It was made, I believe, earlier this year. It does a decent, if somewhat cursory, breakdown of the similarities and divergences of the two characters that I'll be analyzing today. Now, he didn't discuss absolutely everything, or I probably wouldn't be making this video at all, but he did cover a few things I won't be discussing today, largely because the existence of his video would render that act redundant. Particularly, he discusses the origins of the Elric character with a Finnish myth of Kulervo and the pulp antagonist Monsieur Zenith of Sexton Blake fame, both of which Michael Moorcock has not only copped to, he's called further attention to his theft by publishing a Monsieur Zenith story himself. And this is a crucial fact to recognize. While Michael Moorcock has repeatedly acknowledged his inspirations, and in fact, when people ignore them, it only inspires him to trumpet their values even more loudly, Andrei Sapkowski has done precisely the opposite, obfuscating his initial inspirations as being purely couched in Polish myth, which, like most lies, has a degree of truth to it, while skirting the similarities between his own work and that of Michael Moorcock. But The Witcher is a work of plagiarism, as I will ably demonstrate today, and it goes a hell of a lot deeper than just a name and an appearance. But those being the most obvious examples, and the ones Witcher fanboys like the Golden One in a god-awful vlog response from March of this year love to hand wave away without any actual research, and not coincidentally with flat fucking zero personal knowledge of the Elric franchise, look, to ascertain whether this rises to the threshold of plagiarism, however, we need an effective real-world example. Now, I come from comic book fandom, so the one that inevitably springs to mind involves one of the greatest hacks to ever hack a hacksaw, Rob Morepouch please Liefeld. Namely, the kooky case of a character called Fighting American. When the Captain America's original creators became disillusioned with the direction Cap had taken in the fucking 50s, they split and created the short-lived quasi-clone Fighting American. No big deal. After all, it wasn't much of a hit, and so the IP lay dormant for decades, until the neon 90s when Liefeld left Marvel in a huff several issues before his agreed-upon exit, being a talentless fucking boob, he elected to reuse pages he'd previously illustrated for Captain America by altering a few minor details for his own revival of Fighting American. He even gave the fuck a shield as if it weren't already rather on the nose. Marvel sued the living shit out of him, Liefeld had no viable defense, and so he came to the bargaining table, whereupon it was decided Fighting American could ship, provided he never threw the fucking shield. Otherwise, Marvel would have proceeded with the ironclad copyright case, and off to the cleaners he'd go. And what was the similarity in that case? A name and an appearance. That's it! Remember that threshold? Only a similar name and only a similar appearance. Everything I am about to dissect now is the mere crust atop the plagiarism pot pie. There are similarities in the world, characters, storylines, and even the philosophical fucking makeup of both stories and characters, but as I've just established, all they need to be credibly accused of plagiarism is a similar but not identical name and a similar but not identical appearance. And even without the bulk of my argument, which we'll get to at the back end, The Witcher fails to clear that hurdle all by itself. That and that alone would be enough, but as you're about to see, the similarities are far more than merely cosmetic. So that's precisely where we'll begin. After all, Elric and Melna Bonet and Geralt of Rivia are nothing at all alike, apart from the white hair, <laughs> right? A bit 
more than some white hair, I'm afraid. For one thing, they're both albino. And before you crow about Geralt not being albino, better take it up with Sapkowski because that ain't what the books fucking say. Hell, it ain't what several NPCs in the video games say fucking either. Geralt is described not only as pale, but corpse-like. The stranger turned his head. Jurga barely stifled a scream. The stranger's face was white. White and porous, like cheese drained and unwrapped from cloth. And his eyes! Ye gods! Something howled inside Jurga. His eyes! You look as if you were already a corpse witcher, he said. From fear, no doubt. Don't be afraid. I bring you reprieve. Corpse-like visage. Now, where have I heard a similar description? It is the color of a bleached skull, his flesh. And the long hair which flows below his shoulders is milk white. From the tapering, beautiful head stare two slanting eyes, crimson and moody. And from the loose sleeves of his yellow gown emerge two slender hands, also the color of bone, resting on each arm of a seat. Or how about the fact that they have the same nickname? The White Wolf. White Wolf. Wise Wolf. What is it the wolf needs? Now, nut hammocks like the Golden Goof make the half ass counter plea that the White Wolf isn't that original of a nomenclature. And on the surface, I'd even be inclined to agree with them. Until I actually started researching and looked for other characters named the White Wolf in popular culture. Keep in mind, Elric was called the White Wolf in his very first published story, in 1961, that being The Dreaming City. The only other extant examples in pop culture I could personally find were Hunter the White Wolf, a Marvel Comics character created in 1999, one of the many aliases of the Winter Soldier, aka Bucky Barnes, in an Ed Brubaker Captain America story from the mid-2000s, an alias for Jon Snow of Game of Thrones fame in one of many affectionate callbacks to the Elric series that George R.R. R. Martin inserted into the series. Such a great sword should have a name. What shall I call her? Stormbringer! Heavenous! Without wear! Wolfsbane! Now, Martin and Moorcock are good friends, by the way, and when the book became a TV show, they even inserted a Stormbringer reference into one scene. So that ain't exactly copyright plagiarism. Vaynard, a character from the PlayStation RPG Brigandine in 1998, a character for the 1995 animated film Balto, and finally, Geralt of goddamn Rivia. And before you say White Wolf Publishing, creators of Vampire Masquerade, for those who aren't aware, the name of the company is actually an Elric reference, and they even once went so far as to purchase the publication rights to the Elric series and release several Elric collections. Boy, when you backhoe deep enough, apparently White Wolves in pop culture ain't as common as the Apologensia would lead you to believe. But never mind that skin-deep dog shit. What about the fact that both Elric and Geralt are called the White Wolf for effectively the same goddamn reason? Geralt acquires both his Butcher of Blaviken and White Wolf nomenclature during the same event depicted in the pages of The Last Wish. Renfri sprang away as to strike from above as Geralt lunged and swiftly slashed her exposed thigh and groin from below with the very tip of his sword. She didn't cry out. Falling to her side, she dropped her sword and clutched her thigh. Blood poured through her fingers in a bright stream over her decorated belt. The clamour of the swaying crowd, crammed in the streets, grew as they saw blood. Geralt put up his sword. Don't go, she moaned, curling up in a ball. After slaying Renfri, with whom he'd enjoyed a blossoming romance, along with her entire entourage, in full view of the public, Geralt is thereafter dubbed by humans as the Butcher of Blaviken, and by Dryad's Gwynblyde, the White Wolf. And back in Mel Nibonet... Taking advantage of his opponent's distraction, Elric cut deep through his body, almost severing the trunk from the waist. And yet incredibly, Yerkun remained alive, drawing his vitality from the blade which still clashed against Elric's own rune-carved sword. With a final push, he flung Simoril forward, and she died, screaming on the point of Stormbringer. Then Yerkun laughed one final cackling shriek, and his black soul went howling down to hell. The rune sword fell from his grasp, stained by Simoril's lifeblood, and clattered unheeded down the stairs. Sobbing now, Elric dropped beside the dead girl and lifted her in his arms. Simoril, he moaned, his whole body throbbing. Simoril, I have slain you. 
It's only after this that Elric is first called the White Wolf by Melnibonet's rival Pantang. Now the door opened, and a richly dressed youth stood there, staring in. I seek the White Wolf, he said, his head at a questioning angle. He could not see Elric clearly. I'm sometimes called that name in these parts, Elric said calmly. Do you seek Elric of Melnibonet? So sack a city and shank a bitch you recently boned down with, prepare to be named the White Wolf, evidently. Motherfucker, that's much more than a passing similarity. And before we move on to the meat and potatoes, this is all without mentioning, shall we say, their similar sense of style. If you've ever argued Elric and Geralt have utterly separate cosmetic sensibilities due to Elric's Castlevania chic pallor slash black raiment ensemble, yet have only played the Witcher games with their omnicolored palette and hot pink and turquoise checkered jerkins aplenty, you may wish to familiarize yourself with the books. The horseman had hair as white as milk, tied back from his forehead with a leather band, and a black woolen cloak falling over the rump of the chestnut mare. He dismounted and took his cloak from his shoulders. The black leather hip-length jacket with long sleeves sparkling with silver studs might have indicated that the stranger came from Novigrad or the surroundings. He raised the hood of his cloak over his head so that the heavy black fabric completely hid his face. He rode up to meet Divim Slorm, his own sombre clothes contrasting with theirs. He wore a tall-collared jacket of quilted leather, black and buckled in by a broad plain belt at which hung a poignard and Stormbringer. His milk-white hair was held from his eyes by a fillet of black bronze, and his breeks and boots were also black. All this black set off sharply his white skin and crimson glowing eyes. Now, we admittedly have a massive point of departure in the form of Stormbringer, arguably the most unique element of the entire Elric saga, a rune-bespeckled demon blade taken from Kulervo that feeds on the souls of Elric's enemies while preferring that of his allies and seems possessed of its own will, and as chaos takes hold of Elric's world, a sword that becomes increasingly imbued with its own malevolent sentience. It's a fascinating literary device and one that's been stolen with alarming frequency by other fantasy authors, not not to mention World of Warcraft, which is probably why Sapkowski took care not to include it in his. But while the Witcher series features no soul-sapping longsword with a thirst for Geralt's friends and immediate family, at least none that I've encountered reading the entire book series, it does reference spells, weapons, and even beings who feast on the souls of others. They're simply not made central narrative elements as in Elric. And thanks to CD Projekt, as recently as Witcher 3, we do have ebony blades constructed of otherworldly runic metal that throb with nondescript red symbols. To say nothing of a certain DLC featuring an omniscient entity of chaos known as Master Mirror, whose favorite meal is, you guessed it, other people's souls. And in a narrative context, from her moral ambiguity, potential for evil, initial childlike aspect, to her narrative utility as a vessel to unleash chaos onto an unsuspecting world, it's not that Sapkowski didn't steal Stormbringer, it's more that he gave it tits and called it Siri. But we'll get to how CD Project is help the plagiarism along in a New York minute. Before we get into the good shit, allow me to address the following cosmetic critiques. But Geralt has a beard! One, only in the video games, and two, sometimes, so the fuck does Elric. But, but, but Geralt dual wields two swords. Elric only wields one. Actually, neither of those statements is factual, going off the original Witcher and Elric novels. While it's often stated that Geralt uses a steel sword for humans and a silver one for the supernatural, it's only ever mentioned that he carries one at a time. Look no further than the CGI short film made for the first Witcher game, which is a direct adaptation of one of the short stories from The Last Wish for confirmation that he generally only carries one. The dual wheel building trope is largely an invention of CD Projekt Red for the video games. Chińczyków, ponieważ tu w wszystkich krajach ta gra się pojawi, żeby być identyfikowalny, żeby widząc człowieka z białymi włosami, dwoma mieczami na plecach, mogli powiedzieć, to jest Geralt, to jest Geralt z Rivi. I Look, and even if he wasn't, Elric wields more than one blade on numerous occasions throughout the Elric saga, as does his roguish companion Moonglum. But, but the characters are nothing alike! Geralt is a mercenary, and Elric is an emperor! Ah, but that's not how the characters were first introduced to the public. The very first Elric novel, the conveniently digestible little tome most people have actually read, entitled Elric and Melnibene, is in fact a prequel. That is the novel that emphasizes the character's imperial bearing and origin story. How he first 
first came to forsake the throne, and so forth. It is not, however, the first Elric story, nor is it the most representative of the character, or the most acclaimed. The first Elric story is called The Dreaming City, which was later collected along with Wild God's Laugh and released in novel form as The Weird of the White Wolf. If that seems convoluted, just know that the first Elric story is actually the third book in the series, and the first and second novels were written afterward in an effort to explain the character's prehistory. At the outset of The Dreaming City, Elric is a wayfaring mercenary, leading a pirate fleet against his own kingdom. It isn't even mentioned that he's from Mel Libane, let alone the Emperor, until Chapter 2, for fuck's sake! Elric, as he was first introduced to begin with, is an albino swordsman and soldier of fortune with an affinity for magical runes. All succeeded in increasing the feeling that he was alone and without friends in the world. Even Simra and Divim Tvar were finally Melnebeneans and could not understand the peculiar concerns which moved him and dictated his actions. Perhaps it would be wise to renounce everything Melnebenean and wander the world as an anonymous soldier of fortune, serving whoever needed his aid. What would your business be, Master Elric, if it is not theatrical? Elric shook his head. I have practiced the trade of mercenary sword for some while. And you, sir? Which dovetails almost perfectly with Geralt, who apart from practicing the trade of what is effectively a supernatural bounty hunter, I believe being lifted from Solomon Cain personally, has hired his services out as a mercenary on numerous occasions, reluctantly in almost every case. I understand that you, a witcher, wander from one end of the world to the other, and should you come across a monster along the way, you kill it. And you earn money doing that. Does that describe the witcher's trade? More or less. And does it ever happen that someone specifically summons you somewhere, on a special commission, let's say? Then what? You go and carry it out? That depends on who asks me and why. And for how much? That too. Everything can be dealt with. It's only a question of price. Bloody hell, there must be a figure on your witch's price list for work that borders on the impossible. I can guess one, and it isn't low. You ensure me my outcome, and I will give you what you ask. What did you say? I'll give you whatever you ask for, and I don't like being told to repeat myself. I wonder, Witcher, do you always try to dissuade your employers as strongly as you are me? Hey gang, two guesses who else is a reluctant albino mercenary? We need your particular qualities as a swordsman and sorcerer, Lord Eric, and we'll of course pay well for them. Pilarmo, overdressed, intense, and scrawny, was main spokesman of the four. And how shall you pay, gentlemen? inquired Elric politely, still smiling. Pilarmo's colleagues raised their eyebrows, and even their spokesman was slightly taken aback. He waved his hand through the smoky air of the tavern room, which was occupied only by the six men. In gold? In, in gems? answered Pilarmo. In chains, said Elric. We free travelers have no need of chains of that sort. And yet both protagonists serve as grudging agents of order in a world increasingly swallowed by the forces of chaos, each a pale mercenary spell sword with a fate repeatedly acknowledged as being both predestined and unchangeable. I am a goddess. You are the Sword of Destiny. Death has followed you for years. Perhaps. Accept this gift from the Lady of the Lake. It will help you fulfill your destiny. What gift is that? Neil, Geralt of Rivia, White Wolf. You traveled a long path fraught with danger. You demonstrated courage and goodness. By divine power, I hereby knight you. Face your enemies without fear. Safeguard the helpless. Never lie, even if it means your death. And then there's both stories odd preoccupation with potions. Geralt with the trial of the grasses, which first imbued him with his abilities. Plants were everywhere. They grew out of beds, hewn into the bedrock, and filled with peat, in enormous chests, troughs, and flowerpots. 
They climbed up rocks, up wooden trellises and stakes. Geralt examined them with interest, recognizing some rare specimens, those which made up the ingredients of a witch's medicines and elixirs, magical filters and a sorcerer's decoctions, and others, even rarer, whose qualities he could only guess at. Everything seems to be in order, she said. Lie down before the elixirs knock you off your feet. Those mixtures are devilishly dangerous. They'll destroy you in the end. I have to take them before I fight. And Elric, with his own sorceress trials, which not only imbued him with his abilities, but relayed the knowledge of sorceress potions, which compensate for the weakness of his thin blood. By magic potions and the chanting of runes, by rare herbs had her son been nurtured, his strength sustained artificially by every art known to the sorcerer kings of Maldimbene. And he had lived, still lives, thanks to sorcery alone, for he is naturally lassitudinous, and without his drugs would barely be able to raise his hand from his side through most of a normal day. Well, there it is, you say! Geralt brews and consumes potions solely to augment his already excellent combat abilities, while Elric must consume alchemic concoctions in order to survive. Bit of a boo-boo, though. This is true only for the bulk of the first Elric story, which, as we already established in my Enter Elric video some time back, is actually a prequel, written two books after the fact. At the end of said story, he acquires Stormbringer, whose soul-stealing chaos magic forms a parasitic bond with the albino mercenary, so that for almost the entire story thereafter, with the exception of one very brief segment in The Bane of the Black Sword, he no longer acquires potions to survive. After this point, Elric only consumes drugs, potions, mutagens, or anything else to supplement his strength, endurance, and even eyesight. On one occasion, he even ingests butt-fucking berserker potions distilled from dragon venom! He remembered his father's last words. They in turn made him recollect an old herbal which had spoke of the distillation of dragon venom, how it brought courage to the weak and skill to the strong, how a man might fight for five days and nights and feel no pain. So no, numbnuts, they both brew potions and they both consume them for the same reason. Not looking good for the G-Man, but what if they're magic? Oh, I'm sorry. What Witcher fanboys insist is not in fact magic, because Geralt being an albino spellsword is a bit of a bad look when you're making the indefensible case of the Witcher not being a work of plagiarism. Well, Subkoski cucks, I'm afraid that's not what the Witcher books say. I'm trying to explain why sorcerers aren't fond of village quacks, charmers, healers, wise women, and witches. Call it what you will, even simple envy. But here lies the cause of the animosity. It annoys us when we see magic, a craft we were taught to treat as an elite art, a privilege of the few and a sacred mystery, in the hands of laymen and dilettantes. And magic, Geralt? Those witcher spells of yours about which so many tales circulate? A Doppler is only magically detectable in its own form, and doesn't walk down the street in it. And even if it did, Magic would be no use. Which brings us to the other idiotic defense. Elric is a full-blown elemental mage, while Geralt simply casts signs with his fingertips. Well, while Geralt does indeed cast signs, which is effectively runic sign language, said runes are based on the elements. Ard, Igni, Yirden, Quen, Axi, and about that whole Elric being a full-blown sorcerer thing. There have you no horse sorcery to trap the horse? Sorcery does not come so easily to me, for I have no great liking for it. Elric's skill in sorcery lay chiefly in his command over the various elementals of air, fire, earth, water, and ether. And how does he summon those elementals? Take a guess. Runes, both rhythmic and fragmented, howled now from Elric's throat. His brain had reached the plane on which Ariok dwelt. Now it sought Ariok himself. There are four sorts, just as there are four planes. Jinns are air creatures. Marides are associated with the principle of water. Afrit are fire genies, and Dao, the genies of earth. There goes the magic counter-argument! The first Witcher game, the one where the novel's Elric-swiped themes are, I believe, the most apparent, centers around a conflict between Salamandra, a black-clad force with armor emblazoned with a chaos symbol, and the Order of the Rose. Literally, 
order versus chaos. Why is this significant? Because Elric is an eternal champion, an eternally reincarnated hero whose aspect exists in every reality under different names and aspects, alone in his own time. It's only after merging with other realities within the multiverse that he realizes he, in fact, belongs to an order of eternal champions, along with Erikose, Corum, and others, resulting in two major team-ups of sorts in two different Elric novels, Sailor on the Seas of Fate, and finally, I believe, in The Vanishing Tower. Their order exists for one reason, and one reason alone to balance the warring forces of their world and drive back the chaos. Perhaps the single most distinguishing characteristic of the Elric series is its central narrative theme. While there are certainly other fantasy worlds that are better fleshed out in terms of topography, anthropology, or linguistics, very few have every rivet and stitch woven about the central narrative conflict. Not good versus evil, not even man versus man as Robert E. Howard was fond of writing. Order versus chaos. But it's, it's, the, it's part of the cosmology that I use, um, which is the idea that, it, that not good and evil, but uh, law and chaos, which I think better represent um, human, human traits, because you can have good people who, you know, who are for chaos, and you can have bad people who are for law. Chaos is the source of magic, as explained numerous times, and therefore Elric, with his Melnibonean ancestry, is effectively birthed a creature of chaos from a kingdom of chaos. Yet unlike his countrymen, a life spent in study has caused his soul to strive for order, or more accurately, for balance. This is another of Elric's contributions to modern fantasy. In lieu of Tolkien or C.S. Lewis's morally binary antagonist being vanquished by fated heroes, Elric is a hero fated to doom and suffering, a pawn in a game between the forces of order and the forces of chaos. This conflict has inspired myriad modern fantasy works, from the pagans and hammerites of the Thief video game series to the omnipresent gray morality of Game of Thrones, and we won't even talk about Warhammer. Elric is a creature of chaos, fated to bring the return of order, though reluctantly allied with the forces of it. Ariok's silvery voice lost some of its beauty, and his face seemed to cloud for a second. You are pledged to serve chaos, Elric, as were your ancestors. You will serve chaos. The time draws near when both law and chaos will battle for the realm of Earth, and chaos shall win. Earth will be incorporated into our realm, and you will join the hierarchy of chaos, become as immortal as we are. Immortality offers little to me, my lord, Elric replied. His sword Stormbringer is able to vanquish the thralls of chaos because it is an instrument of it. The sad giant shield he acquires in the climactic novel Stormbringer is likewise of chaos manufacture, the only objects that can shield him from the weapons of chaos. Chaos formed this earth, and for eons chaos ruled. Men were created to put an end to that rule. But my ancestors worshipped the powers of chaos. My patron demon, Ariok, is a duke of hell, one of the prime lords of chaos. Just so. You and your ancestors were not true men at all, but an intermediary type created for a purpose. You understand chaos as no true men ever could understand it. You can control the forces of chaos as no true men ever could. You can weaken the forces of chaos, for you know the qualities of chaos. Weaken them is what you have done. As I said before, agents of order in the world of Elric and the Moorcock multiverse are dubbed the Eternal Champion, predestined to provide balance in a world where an interdimensional rift between worlds, which we'll talk about more in a moment, has inadvertently allowed chaos, and thus all magic, to spill into and ultimately overpower their reality. Hmm. Chaos fueling magic. Now where have I- Chaos is the most dangerous thing in this world. It is all around us, all the time. Magic is organizing chaos. And while oceans of mystery remain, we have deduced that this requires two things. Balance and control. 
in both series, chaos becomes manifest in the form of an army clad in black, subjugating the world around them. In Elric's case, the armies of Pantang and Jagreen Learn, and in Geralt's, the armies of Nilfgaard, and at least in the video games, his enemies in Salamandra. Now once again, remind me what symbol is emblazoned on Salamandra's armor Oh right! Did I mention Michael Moorcock himself actually invented the chaos symbol by scribbling it onto a napkin for the artist illustrating his pulps in the 60s? In both cases, said armies are initially presented as morally ambiguous, driven by conquest or politics, and in both cases, more nefarious intent is uncovered at their core. By the end of the Elric saga, the Pantangian hordes are ultimately supplanted by their greed and literally subjugated in physical thrall to the forces of chaos, and by the end of the Witcher, Nilfgaard have gone from mere political antagonist to borderline binary black hat conquering hordes whose progress is rumored but never explicitly proven to be aided by chaos magic. Are you afraid the Nilfgaardians, the black forces, will return? They found a way through the mountains once already. Well, we're afeard. And what of it? Do we sit down and weep and tremble? Life must go on. And what will be, will be. What is destined can't be avoided in any case. Jagreen learns earthly conquests are near complete. Once, once consolidated, they will give him more power to summon further allies from chaos. The strongest forces of that realm will join with him. With the help of Pyare and his Chaos fleet, he is already all but invincible. Well fuck, Razor! Order? Chaos? Fate? That doesn't sound anything like the Witcher! That sounds like an awful lot of fucking philosophy! I warn you, some philosophy's involved. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. I mean, I can't imagine there being any philosophical overlap whatsoever! The evil that Witchers fight stems from Chaos, from actions aimed at disturbing order. For where evil spreads, order cannot be established. Instead of the light of wisdom, the glimmer of hope, and the glow of warmth, darkness ensues. And in darkness you find nothing but blood, fangs, and claws. But if chaos should win, then doom will cloud the very air, agony will sound in the wind, and foul misery will dominate a plunging, unsettled world of sorcery and evil hatred. Well, shit! I'm sure the video game developers pulled that out of their ass for the game's benefit exclusively, even though you'll recall the only reason this video exists at all is because people are claiming CD Projekt are innocent of any plagiarism whatsoever. Fuggin' oops! But still, this couldn't possibly be present in the books as well! The conflict between the forces of order and the forces of chaos, as a sorcerer acquaintance of mine used to say. I imagine that you carry out your mission, defending people from evil always and everywhere, without distinction. You stand on a clearly defined side of the palisade. The forces of order, the forces of chaos. Awfully high flown words, Bo. You desperately want to position me on one side of the palisade in a conflict which is generally thought to be perennial, began long before us, and will endure long after we've gone. I understand you aren't keen on being placed on either side. You do your job. That's correct. But you cannot escape the conflict between chaos and order. Although it was your comparison, you are not a farrier. I've seen you work. You go down into a dungeon among some ruins and come out with a slaughtered basilisk. There is, comrade, a difference between shoeing horses and killing basilisks. You said that if the payment is fair, you'll hurry to the end of the world and dispatch the monster you're asked to. Let's say a fierce dragon is wreaking havoc on a bad example, Geralt interrupted. You see, right away, you've mixed up chaos and order because I do not kill dragons, and they, without doubt, represent chaos. So yeah, apart from the core philosophical dilemma of the world, one effectively pioneered by Michael Moorcock in a fantasy context in the 60s, and the chaos symbol he invented, yet which the Witcher games weld to the armor of your enemies, no similarities to the world whatsoever. Which brings us to both characters' fate. And now there is no turning back at all. Elric's destiny has been forged and fixed as surely as the Hell Swords were forged and fixed aeons before. Was there ever a point where he might have turned off this road to despair, damnation and destruction? Or has he been doomed since before his birth? Doomed through a thousand incarnations to know little else but sadness and struggle, loneliness and remorse? Eternally the champion of some unknown cause. Al 
Elric is doomed, existing beneath the perpetual sword of Damocles, aware he's predestined to perish, powerless to stop it, quietly defiant of it, with fate not to mention Stormbringer murdering all his closest friends and lovers all the while. Stormbringer turned in Elric's hand, howling its satiated glee, and clove down at Rakir. Seeing his fate, the Red Archer sobbed and sought to avoid the blow, but it landed in his shoulder blade and sheared down to his breastbone. Elric, not my soul, too. And so died the hero, Rakir the Red Archer, famous in the Eastlands as the saviour of Tanelorn, cloven by a friend's treacherous blade. And Elric laughed until realisation came. Destiny, it seems, cannot catch up with Elric, and so it settles for those he loves. Now, where else have I heard that before? Yennefer. The sword of destiny has two blades. You are one of them. But what is the other, white wolf? Blood drips in a thin stream from the corner of her mysteriously and hideously smiling mouth. You sneer at destiny, she says, still smiling. You sneer at it. Trifle with it. The sword of destiny has two blades. You are one of them. It's the second. Death. But it is we who die. Come the fuck on! Not to mention the fact that both characters are similarly preoccupied with the concept of their destiny and whether or not free will exists at all. Don't you believe in destiny? I don't know if I believe in anything. Moonglum shrugged. I sometimes wonder, Elric, if this grim destiny of yours is a figment of your own guilt-ridden mood. Perhaps, Elric replied carelessly. But I do not care to test the theory. Let's speak no more of this. I don't want to know. I know my fate whirls about me like water in a weir. It's hard on my heels, following my tracks, but I never look back. You cannot stop this, Witcher. Death follows you. This doom is made repeatedly apparent in their relationships being similarly predestined for failure. Forgive me my frankness and forthrightness, Yennefer. It is written all over your faces. I don't even have to try to read your thoughts. You were made for each other, you and the Witcher. But nothing will come of it. Nothing. I'm sorry. I know. Yennefer blanched slightly. I know. You will destroy us, Elric. No. I will build something that will be better. I will discover things. When I return, we shall marry, and we shall live long, and we shall be happy, Simran. And now Elric had told three lies. The first concerned his cousin, Irkun. The second concerned the Black Sword. The third concerned Simran. And upon those three lies was Elric's destiny to be built. For it is only about things which concern us most profoundly that we lie clearly and with profound conviction. But what is that amorphous destiny, you ask? <sighs> Spoiler alert! Just to fucking die! Now, destined as we all are to do a six-foot faceplant and shuffle off this mortal coil, I'd understand if you'd be somewhat incredulous at this being described as an area of overlap, but you have to understand Elric's profound influence in this regard. Bear in mind, Michael Moorcock, again, began this series in 1961. The popularity of Lord of the Rings was still building somewhat at that time. Robert E. Howard was less than three decades in the ground, and his stories were still in wide circulation. Elric's contemporaries aren't gay David Eddings, George R.R. R. Martin, or Robert Jordan, they're C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, the latter of whom he actually met in real life. Elric existed as a fist in the face of these only recently established tropes, in fact. The reason why it's so much science fiction is, is infantile is because the characters are not complex. They can't afford to be complex, so it's, so it's perfectly fair to make them adolescents. Um, but as you become interested in character, um, in individuals, in creating individuals and putting them in specific situations, you gradually lose the science fiction elements. I mean, we, we suddenly found ourselves, again, innocently, in the position of being rebels. We didn't think we were. We thought we were, you know, joining the team, if you like. We thought, you know, we were excited by the possibilities, but they weren't. They, 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 Frederick Pohl said of me when I started New Worlds, 
when it had been going a little while, is I spent 20 years building up these, these genre conventions. I'm not going to start breaking them now. Again, I must summon the eternal enemy of the internet, fucking context. This is the early 60s. We're at least seven years away from the first spaghetti western to feature a protagonist who gets slaughtered to shit at the end while the bad guys rape and plunder a plenty. We're a full decade away from John Wayne's The Cowboys, the first major western to feature a hero who dies at the end. This tragic hero predestined to die in his quest shit was not only not a trope in fantasy at this time, it wasn't much of a trope in any other popular entertainment of this period, really. We were only just rocking out of the shit slick of the down-home 1950s. A white picket fence and a chicken in every pot. A model Susie Homemaker who diverts her frustrated sexual energy into increasingly elaborate hair helmets at the salon. Moreover, this trope wasn't particularly common even when The Witcher swiped it decades later. It's one thing to have the same appearance, same skills, same name, and reason for that name. It's another thing entirely to have your story end the same fucking way. Geralt interrupted the turn to spin back the other way. But he was stuck in the crowd. He was stuck in the crowd for a split second. All he could do was watch as the three-fanged fork flew towards him. Stabbed in the chest with a pitchfork by a man of whom we know only that his name was Rob, and he owed three crowns at the local tavern. Yennefer of Engerberg died as trying to heal the witcher. The bodies of Geralt and the sorceress are taken away by a mysterious young girl with ashen hair. He turned his head to one side and saw the blade leave the ground, sweep into the air and then rush down on him. Stormbringer! he cried. And then the hell sword struck his chest. He felt the icy touch of the blade against his heart. Oh, but their personalities are nothing alike. Elric fucks a woman in every part. Geralt is only a man whore in the video games. Fucking oh! Geralt opens the last wish by ramming a random whore. By the end of it, he's banged at least two chicks that aren't Yennefer, at least one of whom he's fucking killed. Two guesses what other character you can say that about. He fucked Shani in Blood of Elves, it's made clear he previously fucked Triss, and it's even hinted that he may have banged the bitch out of Philippa Eilhart, including Yennefer. That's five chicks before we're out of the first sequential novel in the Diddy fucking series. Are you a Witcher or Wilt Chamberlain? And you may also note some similarities in the broads he's been betting. Foremost among them, Yennefer, a snarky, sarcastic, self-determined sorceress equally as doomed as her lover, whose entanglements with sorceress politics provide impetus for several conflicts in the core Witcher series, all of which is on full display even in the CD Projekt video games. For Elric, foremost among them might seem to be Cimmeril, but bear in mind, she exists only in the first Elric story, which is in actuality, as we've said, a prequel. Most of his other romantic dalliances are with the likes of eventual wife Zerozinia, the red-headed daughter of a dead necromancer named Shirilla, as well as Michella, who spans several books, also a raven-haired sorceress, who he meets when he awakens her from a sleeping beauty-like stasis spun by fellow spell-slinger Theleb Karna, a powerful corrupt wizard who will haunt Elric for several stories thereafter. Geralt is accompanied by Dandelion, a jovial bard and rogue who composes epic songs about his adventures with Geralt. Elric is accompanied by Moonglum, a jovial rogue, and for a story or two, Ernest Weldrake, a jovial bard who is, you guessed it, composing an epic poem about Elric during their adventures. And the worlds they inhabit court comparisons aplenty. Both are men out of their time, unique even among their already unique compatriots. Upon meeting Elric, the other eternal champions remark at his odd appearance and behavior, while Geralt is a mutant even amongst his own. Hmm. Do all witchers have white hair? No, milady. I am alone in that. But his reading has also taught him to question the uses to which power is put, to question his motives, to question whether his own power should be used at all, in any cause. His reading has led him to this morality, which, still, he barely understands. Thus, to his subjects, he is an enigma, and to some, he is a threat, for he neither thinks nor acts in accordance with their conception of how a true Melnibonean should think and act. And now, as he stood beside a bleak sea feeling trapped and already defeated, he knew himself to be alone in a malevolent universe, bereft of friends and purpose, a useless, sickly anachronism, 
a fool brought low by his own insufficiencies of character, by his profound inability to believe wholly in the rightness or the wrongness of anything at all. Both men strive to bring balance to the world where chaos is spilled into their ordered universe, but both acknowledge that order is an imbalance of its own. Evil has ceased being chaotic. No longer a blind elemental power, evil follows rules according to the rights it's been granted. It functions in line with treaties. Witchers exist to slay monsters. How can I when the real monsters hide behind ideals, faith, or the law? Stormbringer. It has brought enough storms for me. Perhaps this time it can calm one. And what if law should win? And if law should win, then that too will mean the decline and death of this world. We shall all be forgotten. When you break it down, witchers are just eternal champions that get paid to bring about the cosmic balance. They're criminal, evil to the core. Salamandra upsets the balance. As a witcher, I can't ignore that. Which, given that Elric finds a way to be paid throughout the saga while doing exactly that, effectively demolishes that line of demarcation as well. Hell, witchers even have the fact that they're creating order from chaos spelled the fuck out for them more than once. Chaos and order. Villain to Tenmerth smiled. Do you remember Geralt? Chaos is aggression. Order its protection against it. It's worth rushing to the ends of the world to oppose aggression and evil, isn't it, Witcher? Particularly, as you said, when the pay is fair. And this time it was. The pervasive feeling of a sudden change in the forces of chaos and thus magic itself and its inevitable effect on a seemingly dying world pervades both series as well. Something utterly unique to Elric at the time that the Witcher, once again, elected to swipe. There will never be another Bright Empire. Nor can their power last more than 10,000 years. This is a fresh age, did him Slorm, in more than one way. The time of subtle sorcery is on the wane. Men are finding new means of harnessing natural power. Aye, it is fitting that we should be wanderers, for we have no place in this world. No doubt your life will end soon and how useless it's been. You'll die knowing you're an aberration. You're so full of shit, Professor. Why do you seek to prevent the creation of new witches? The answer's simple. You feel you have no rightful place in this world. What the hell do they need a witcher here for? When I ask after employment, they look at me as if I'm a freak. The world is changing. Something's coming to an end. The poet took a long pull at the demijohn, narrowed his eyes and sighed heavily. Are you crying over your sad fate as a witcher again? and philosophizing on top of that. Now back to that rift between worlds I referenced earlier and its relationship to the forces of chaos. Eternal champions of the world of Elric are only able to converge when their realities do likewise. When this happens, beings of both order and chaos spill forth from one reality to the next, which is widely believed to be what unleashed both magic and monsters into the young kingdoms to begin with. What is the name of the cataclysm responsible for the cohabitation of chaos and order in the world of Elric, allowing the intersection of multifarious fucking realities, one that indeed allows the existence of the dragons that Geralt refuses to kill, and Elric not only won't whack, but outright fucking rides? Well, in the Elric saga, its name is... The Conjunction of Spheres. Somehow, she had to return Elric to his own dimensions without creating further disruptions in the fabric of time and space. The conjunction was not due yet, and, if things got any worse, might never come. So many plans depended on the conjunction of the million spheres that she could not risk its failure. But she could not reveal too much either to Elric or his hosts. Now where, oh where, have I heard that name before? By the power of the spheres, moaned the magician activating what little remained of her strength and drawing her hand through the air. I throw a spell on you by water, fire, earth and air. See, when humans and monsters all arrived after the conjunction of the spheres, Elven mages taught the first humans how to turn chaos into magic. Remember, because this is important, Graviers, like ghouls and other monsters in this category, do not have their own ecological niche. They are relics from the age of the interpenetration of spheres. You owe your existence to the conjunction of spheres. But your creators erred. Know how? Enlighten me. 
They failed to strip you of emotion. You were meant to slay monsters without making judgments, philosophizing or nursing doubts. You're ineffective. Well, this ineffective, doubt-ridden historical freak is about to kill you. So yeah! Apart from the central philosophical conflict of the series, how it affects the world, the population, magic, and transdimensionality, and apart from its core relationship to both protagonists and the dying orders they represent, and Witcher's and Eternal Champion's relationship with the formative conjunction of spheres event that created the fucking world, which, oh hey, by the way, is called the exact same fucking thing, and apart from the name, the appearance, many of the abilities, the supporting cast, the raven-haired sorceress love interest, and even exact fucking plot details... Yeah, they're really nothing the fuck at all alike. Ah, oh, but Razor, surely Andrei Sapkowski couldn't have even heard of the Elric series. After all, he was behind the Iron Curtain in occupied communist Poland. Yeah, about that. Sapkowski having forsaken an earlier, less amusing career, he actually began working as a translator of fantasy fiction. He did this in or around the mid-1980s. If a well-known English fantasy series was to be brought to Poland, it would be incumbent upon Sapkowski to translate the text into Polish, often with the necessary socialist censorship. Why is this significant? Because 1985 was the very year Elric of Maldobone was at last translated into Polish. And wouldn't you know it, that just so happens to be the exact same year Sapkowski began writing the first draft of the fucking Witcher. Hmm, quite the coinky of a ding-dong dink. But don't believe me, believe Sapkowski himself. Writing in a supplemental text entitled Manuscript Found in a Dragon's Cave, Andrei Sapkowski ranks what he calls his official canon of fantasy fiction. And yes, friends, he includes Elric of Maldabene while simultaneously refusing to acknowledge his influence cum theft a solitary fucking time. And honestly, that's the bit that bothers me the most. I probably wouldn't have stopped reviewing the games if he'd at least brought himself to admit the theft. Morcock, as I've said, is passionate and vocal about the inspirations for the Elric series, and even calls himself a thief. He's aware and proud of that character's influences, but he also knows he didn't do it alone. Not so for Sapkowski. And to me, this has always been the most important distinction between the two, for the line between inspiration and plagiarism is citation. So you ask... Why didn't Michael Moorcock sue? And that's a fair question, seeing as when The Witcher was initially brought to his attention on his official fan forum, Michael Moorcock's immediate reaction was to say, quote, those bastards, and quote, I've been talking to my lawyer about it, which gave rise to the erroneous contention among RPG Codexian cunthoods that Moorcock had actually attempted to sue him, something neither I nor any of the people who accused Sapkowski of plagiarism long before I did ever actually claimed. Truth is, he never actually bothered to sue, and not for the first time when confronted with clear IP theft. Many modern IPs borrowed liberally from Elric, though few as fucking blatantly as The Witcher, and Moorcock hasn't bothered to legally shithammer many of them at all. And there are myriad reasons why, not the least of which is, for all The Witcher fanboys' accusations that he's a crotchety old IP Scrooge, he's really not all that territorial about his intellectual property at all! But otherwise, I mean, where, wherever, you know, wherever people have, have been inspired to, to write something, I don't have any problems at all, and, and in fact don't feel any uh, proprietorial um, feeling. I don't have that towards my characters particularly, um, which is why I gave Jerry Cornelius to any writer that came to me and said they wanted to write it. We all do it, you know, we're, in, we're, we're inspired by some people, we ins if, we, if we're lucky we inspire other people. Which isn't to say he doesn't resent theft of intellectual property, as you can immediately distinguish by the merest mention of the omnipresent plagiarism of the Warhammer series. Well, I think Warhammer are simple thieves. I mean, they, they, they don't just steal from me, they steal from everybody. So, um, I, you know, that, that's, as far as I'm concerned, that, that's, that's simple theft. It's commercial theft. Long story short, look, 
He's an old man with health issues. He wants to spend what time he has left creating, not slamming half-wit hacks with copyright injunctions. A man clear-headed enough to discern that his Elric series has been ripped off with a frequency rivaled by Dita Von Teese's nipple tape, and is very likely not predisposed to spend what time he has left offending the entire nation of Poland by proving that one of their most cherished and profitable creative cultural exports is in fact an exercise in intellectual property theft. Nikt w historii nie miał i mam nadzieję, że tą szansę wykorzystaliśmy. Szansę na to, aby polska kultura, w tym momencie też polski bohater, wymyślam przez Andrzeja Sapkowskiego, zaistniał. And there's at least tangential evidence to suggest, far from being innocent, CD Projekt may have actually contributed to and even at least incidentally attempted to cover up the plagiarism as well. The Witcher 1 dropped in 2007, immediately after which the Moorcock Miscellany Forums brought the obvious overlap to the attention of Michael Moorcock, who consulted his lawyer but ultimately elected not to sue because, as I've already already mentioned, he's actually not that protective of his own creations. Not before starting a minor stir on the interwebs, however, with the Witcher forums even abuzz over the accusations. And sure as shit, when Witcher 2 dropped, the Witcher of the books, as seen in the first games, with his lighter pallor, thinner build, and tendency toward lengthy philosophical asides about the influence of law, chaos, destiny, and fucking fate, many of which were lifted word for word from the original fucking text, was abandoned entirely. Suddenly and conveniently, CD Projekt elected an art design overhaul, one that can't entirely be explained by a mere graphical upgrade. In lieu of the sickly swordsman and spellslinger Geralt, an incrementally more buff, decidedly less sallow and pale character, square-jawed with yet more scars to further obscure comparisons to Elric, emerged. The conjunction of spheres, a core plot element of the original game, was rarely if ever referenced in The Witcher 2. Not coincidentally, it was also one of the elements Moorcock and company took specific exception to in the original thread, and then, conveniently, it was all but gone. The game was a hit, and naysayers and Elric fans, aware of the comparisons, were shouted down. Hell, most motherfuckers who claim the two characters aren't alike at all have rarely played the second Witcher, let alone the far more similar first one. The Witcher 3, a full-blown corporate AAA extravaganza with all the incumbent astroturfed advertising in tow, went even further to separate itself, and Geralt getting a bearded, burly, and buff makeover all but made him unrecognizable from the character in any of the books. Fuck up, Fred, I'll go! A wheeze in soup throw! That'd make for an awfully veiny morsel. Right through that. Just look at the plowed bastard. Naught but skin and bones. Huh? Yet in a show of arrogance, the conjunction of spheres was reincorporated as a major plot element in The Witcher 3. CD Projekt presumably assuming they'd vanquished the shadow of the Elric theft. Not so fucking much, asshole. How celebrated is The Witcher in its homeland? When the Polish Prime Minister met with Barack Obama for the first time, they assembled what's called a diplomacy package, a simple courtesy compiled of culturally relevant minutia that defines the history and character of the nation of Poland. Included in that package were Witcher novels. If Moorcock were to call Sapkowski on his profligate profiteering now, he would be fighting not only Sapkowski and likely Warner Brothers as well, as they're the North American distributors of the Witcher games, he would be fighting effectively the entire nation of Poland. Despite the fact that we have a treaty in that connection, given the insult to their national identity, I wouldn't be at all surprised if they were reluctant to extradite Sapkowski for a copyright trial at all. Long story short, if he was so inclined, Michael Moorcock not only could sue Sapkowski by any reasonable metric, he would likely win. He's decided not to, as he's not all that proprietary toward his creations, and I respect that. But as I believe this video ably demonstrates, it's not for lack of a case. And all of this, all of it, is on top of what we already know. In past cases, as I already illustrated, all one needed to be accused of plagiarism was a character with a similar name, and a similar appearance. And The Witcher goes well in excess of that, and CD Projekt 
have helped him do it. This isn't some fly-by-night fucking company barely entangled in the series. These dudes drafted the first maps of the Witcher world, coined the name Witcher, as some of you may be aware it was previously known as the Hexer, emphasized Morcock's conjunction of spheres as a core plot point of the first and third fucking games, and even ganked much of the Wild Hunt concept not merely from the mythology, but from the chaotic apocalypse from the climactic Elric novel Stormbringer. It's one of the reasons I'm excited to see CD Projekt finally striking out on their own with Cyberpunk. Tabula fucking rasa with no plagiarism allegations in tow. They're talented as merry fuck as developers, and I want to see what they can do with their own property, not one licensed from someone else. Look, until recently, I firmly believed I'd shot my proverbial wad all over the T-zone of the aging porn starlet that is the Witcher franchise. But you simpering shitbags just won't let it the fuck go, will you? Can't even vaguely exceed that you're applying contradictory logic to equivalent situations. You know, self-deceived sort that I am, I'd firmly believe that the mere act of grabbing you slack-jawed deliverance extras by the lapel and all but shrieking in your faces that I wasn't certain plagiarism had actually taken place at the very end of my original Witcher vlog, you may have actually processed and accepted that fact. But you know what? Fuck that dispassionate assertion, because as I've illustrated here today, it's more than slightly plagiarized. And frankly, if we apply the same logic many of you assholes use to call things like, for example, Mass Effect a ripoff of Star Control 2, then The Witcher would not only be considered plagiarism, but plagiarism of the lowest fucking order. Face facts, dipshits. If some ass munch waddled up to you and said, hey bro, try my new game Bonan the Barbarian with a buff black-haired barbarian from Chimeria or some shit on the cover, you'd take less than four complete seconds to call that shit out for being the ripoff it truly is. And what would you have to go on at that point? A name? and an appearance. You wouldn't be breaking each story point down, plot point by plot point, puffs of invisible smoke billowing from the end of your imaginary faux intellectual hipster pipe. Yet for some earth-shatteringly convenient reason, The Witcher is a special case for you, Aspies. No, the name and appearance aren't enough in this case. Let's break down each individual story beat. Let's parse each ass-pounding paragraph for exact sentences lifted from the Elric series. Absent complete chapters quoted whole cloth from Elric, well, we must acquit The Witcher in the court of public opinion. No, motherfucker! How's about we hold The Witcher to the exact same fucking standard to which you hold everything the fuck else? How's about you stop making excuses for a series simply because you happen to enjoy a pair of sop and wet titties in your RPGs? How's about that, you witless sack of wasted flesh and organs? Witcher fanboys, thank you for lending personification to the phrase, the public is an ass. Hell, the similarities themselves aren't even the actual issue here. As I've already illustrated, even Elric was borrowing fairly heavily from other novels and fantasy stories stories of his day. The difference? Michael Moorcock has been more than forthcoming with that fact, and even published stories of his inspirations. Andrei Sapkowski has never admitted for a fucking moment to even being inspired by Elric, which is Fucking bullshit! But as for now, I'm done dunking up Subkovsky. The fan fucks are bad enough, but the last thing I need is some Polak permahack coming to my house and unscrewing all my light bulbs. I'm Razor Fist, blood and souls for Lord Ariak. gotta do is find doo-doo. Greetings! Wouldn't mind a look at your stock. 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 Doo-doo.